Okay, Mrs. Gallivan, I think we're good to go. Sounds good. Okay, everybody, the hour being after seven o'clock, I'd like to call the um, January 19th public hearing to order. It is a public hearing related to the personnel budget. And due to the ongoing COVID-19 COVID pandemic and state of emergency, on, October, we'll on let, March 12th, 2020, Governor tomorrow, Baker we'll issued an executive meeting. order temporarily suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. So we're out there in Walpole Media Land, we are good to go, so I'll give it 15 seconds and then we we'll get From the get open started. meeting law's requirement that meetings be held in public places, open and physically accessible to the public, so long as measures are taken to ensure public access to the body's deliberations through adequate alternative means. The net of that, after increasing some other line items within the budget for transportation, our bus contract in particular, we have negative 120,871, which allows us to reduce the overall cost of the personnel budget above. That's why it's a subtraction. Um, Superintendent Goff mentioned the one-time funds gap from FY21. We have to remember that the 736000 that we used to close the gap in our FY21 budget was a one-time source of funds. So at the end of this year, that money goes away, and we have to replace that with recurring revenue from the town administrator. We've been in constant conversations for several months about this particular figure, making sure that people are clear why that has to be covered and how it differs from a normal recurring budget uh, because it's one-time money. So when you couple these, uh, and you net off these amounts, you get an FY22 level funded budget that increased uh, 2,071,129. That's just for level funding. If we increase our budget for new positions, which we were hoping for because we didn't get any of those last year, as Superintendent Goff mentioned, we would add 400,000 into the budget and look for positions that we'll talk about tonight as priorities that could be funded through that additional 400,000. So that would put the needs-based budget up 2,471,129. So our FY22 budget currently sits at $49,330,005. Uh, the town administrator is currently at 48,605,520. That was our most recent update from the town administrator. Uh, that leaves us a gap that we have to come together and solve as a challenge of 724,485. And that does again include 400,000 worth of uh, new positions if we choose to do that or the school committee supports that. So that's FY22 in a snapshot. Any questions on that slide? Bridger, I think Nancy had a question. You're muted. Yep, it's hard to, to see the screen. So I think it's Nancy, did you have your hand raised? Yeah, I just wanted to, to mention two things. Um, we wanted to talk tonight about the needs of the district because that's part of our responsibility. The 400,000 is just an estimated number. Uh, you know, when Bridget and Mike and I talked, um, we just, we came up with that number. It's, there's nothing special about it. It will, the number will be a, the result of the conversation that we all have tonight. And the, the fact that we have an, an estimated number from the town administrator is great, but that number will change also. Um, as we talked with him most recently, he, he was perfectly honest about the fact that some of his numbers are, um, are based on information that will be more solid a month from now or six weeks from now. So just those two points. Just looking through to make sure there's no one else. You just just would can speak up. Okay, all right. So the the next slide, uh, what the next slide shows is positions, and I just want um, school committee to be aware that um, they're not broken down by department. Um, these are these are a lot of the positions that we had on last year, 
and they're categorized pretty much in the in the order of priority. That doesn't mean that that can't change. Um, again, as Nancy mentioned, this is a discussion. Um, it's a fluid. It's fluid. Um, these are, are some of the ideas and the necessities that um, leadership brings to the table. We would be interested to see have school committee feedback, and um, we're, we actually are meeting tomorrow as uh, a leadership team to continue to, to continue to discuss the budget. So um, why don't we start with the district? Um, again, I've got to fly through. So, um, Bill, do you want to um, mention the um, the ESOL teach the district level ESOL teacher? Yep. Um, and that's at the second line down. Yep. So we're proposing to hire another full time ESOL teacher. Um, that's uh, sometimes known as our EL teachers um, or ELL teachers. If the, the acronym continues to change. Um, currently, our school di district services over 125 uh, English language learners, and uh, just as importantly, about uh, approximately 75, uh, um, 75 to 80 um, formal English language learners, and I'll explain why that matters um, in a minute. Uh, our current structure is we have six full-time ESOL teachers at seven of our school buildings. Um, many years ago, um, at a time where two of our buildings had very low numbers of English language learners. Um, one teacher used to service both an elementary school and a middle school. Uh, times have changed quite a bit uh, in the last several years and um, pretty much all of our schools uh, have a, high, I don't wanna say high number, but a number um, that basically ensure, basically makes it important that we have an ESOL teacher at every building. Um, there's probably the primary reason for that is that um, there's a stronger movement right now and a very important movement that our English language students uh, have an opportunity to uh, improve in their language and receive these services within the classroom in an inclusion setting. Uh, the old model used to pull students out and give the primary instruction to the ESOL teacher. The new model, um, as many of our teachers know, uh, have been trained in SEI an endorsement uh, for English immersion, that's uh, support for students in the classroom and our ESOL teachers are providing more services or should be providing more services within the classroom, which makes it uh, more important than ever that uh, each one of our buildings has a full-time ESOL teacher that can service uh, to meet the needs of RL students. So that is why we were requesting uh, an ESOL teacher so that each building has one, um, one staff member dedicated to that building and to the L students of that building. Thanks, Bill. Um, John Queeley, why don't you go next, Dr. Queeley? Sure. Um, so the position on here I'm going to talk about is the 1.0 middle school uh, special education chair. Uh, and this is a position I've been monitoring for a little while now, although the position is new to this list. Uh, and the reason that I've been monitoring it is each time that, that we've taken a snapshot of the special ed caseload by team chair uh, over the last year or so, um, this position has had the highest caseload uh, relative to all the other chair positions uh, and, and consistently been a good bit higher than, than the other chairs. Uh, when we took the data today, we took a snapshot today, uh, this position has a caseload of 115 students. Uh, the next highest caseload is at the elementary level of, of 94 students. Um, so, so from an equity standpoint, I, I am a little concerned uh, about the volume of work that's flowing through this position. Um, and, and why I bring it up now, uh, given the circumstances, uh, you know, that our students are going through and looking forward to transitions of fifth graders into sixth grade and eighth graders into ninth grade, this is the one position uh, where the individual really touches every building in the district. Uh, the four elementary schools feed into the two middle schools uh, and the eighth graders feed into the high school. So this is a person in a position that uh, spends much of the second half of the year devoted to transitional discussions. And I think at this point, given the circumstances that we're under, um, I'm a little bit worried about uh, the, the amount and the volume of work that this person is gonna undertake here in the second half of the year. So what we'd like to do is um, anchor a second team chair in, in one of the uh, middle school buildings, um, which would divide that caseload uh, a bit more evenly, but also provide a little bit of time to, to repurpose the position a bit uh, and, and allow the, the middle school 
team chair to take a, a more of a, a coaching and, and consultative role in, in the buildings uh, and, and put to use their uh, content expertise a little bit more directly for, for gen ed and special ed teachers uh, and have a little bit more tangible impact with students as opposed to being much more of an administrator uh, and, and even out their, their role a little bit. Uh, so granted, it, it's a new position to this list, but I, I think one that uh, has come into focus this year uh, as being um, a priority for me from a district level. Nancy, would you like to take the questions after each person presents, or do you want to wait to hear them all? Um, let's let's take a couple of breaks just to see if anybody has questions for either um, Bill Hahn or John Cleely. Get it's hard for me to see because I'm the one presenting my screen, so. Um, let us know. I don't see anything in the chat and I'm not seeing any hands, but again, I only have three pictures on my screen also. No, nope, I don't see anybody either. Okay, let's keep going then. Okay, let's move to Walpole High School Principal Inbush. Yes, hello. Um, the first position I'd like to talk about is the uh, health and wellness uh, position at the top of that screen. Um, this is a position I had asked for last year. Uh, we did not get it, obviously, with the uh, with the pandemic hitting, but it ha that has caused us, unfortunately, to take uh, one year step back in how many kids we actually have uh, taking phys ed. We were working towards having all grades take phys ed, and this year is our second year where we cannot have um, all of the seniors take phys ed. It's also a position I'd like to help grow our health classes, possibly looking at a, um, a health two for uh, kids in the upper grades who are heading out to college. Um, I think we, we need something like that because most of our kids taking health right now are in the uh, in the ninth grade. And um, there are certain topics I think that that kids, we can't teach really to those grades, but we should be teaching to the upper grades. So between getting everybody into phys ed and getting um, some more health in um, and wellness classes, um, I would ask that we try to fund uh, that position. Uh, working down, um, there's an ESP ESOL position. This is um, an, uh, basically a, 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 an AIDS aid position to our ESOL program. Currently, I have one official teacher, um, Fran, who's uh, teaching um, all of my EL kids. And as um, Bill Hahn just mentioned, you know, the, the the, the goal is to try and get keep the kids out in the classrooms and um, having Fran or an aide be a, <clears throat> excuse me be able to go out and um, visit those classrooms and know exactly what's going on in the curriculum is essential if we're going to be able to help them through the curriculum. So um, <clears throat> it would be great to get that position in there. And finally, for the high school. Uh, a position I also asked for last year and put back on the list this year is the point four computer science teacher. I currently have a point uh, six computer science teacher, um, and in fact, in the summer that um, the person who would fill that position um, resigned the position, and I have not been able to fill that position unfortunately, even though we spent um, much time posting for it. Um, and one of the reasons, quite honestly, is that it's a 0.6 position. It's very difficult to fill a position like that. Plus, I have um, courses that uh, the kids would like to take that I can't offer um, unless I try to grow this, um, the personnel and um, get enough people to be able to, to teach these courses. So a 0.4 would bring me up to a 1.0. Um, enabling me to be a little more competitive in, in who I'm getting in for the um, when I post for the position and also will enable us to expand our coursework. That is it for the high school. You're going to move on to um, middle school, Nancy? 
Yeah, why don't we do that? And then we'll take questions if there are any. Correct. Okay, middle school, you're up. Okay, hi, everybody. Um, what we have on here for the two middle schools is uh, one transition coach uh, for both schools, uh, the time to be split equally at, at both uh, at each school. Uh, we currently have a grant funded position uh, that just started. Um, and the reason we're looking for a full time is because typically what's been happening over the years is the guidance counselor is the transition coach at, the, at both schools. And so, um, unfortunately, the, the guidance counselor position has evolved over the years uh, that they have to do many more services than they would originally have done. Um, and, you know, it, it encompasses wraparound services, um, you know, facilitating the needs of the students, the families, the teachers, physicians, therapists, and other community agencies. Uh, and part of the job has really expanded to those students who, uh, for one reason or another, whether it be uh, mental or physical health that they've had to leave the buildings for a while and then to try and come back. Now uh, we've supported um, just at, at Bird alone over the past couple of years, um, nine different students uh, who've had to leave and have extended absences and then return. Um, and so that means, you know, uh, more parent meetings, more outside referrals, uh, coming up with the academic tutoring responsibilities. Uh, and then transition back to school and providing social and emotional support. Um, and along with this, the, the council also has many other duties and they're in charge of um, all of the uh, regular ed 504s. Um, when I say regular ed, I mean they're not medical. These are academic 504s, not medical 504s. Um, they're also involved in helping out with special education, uh, especially for initials. Um, so what's happened is that in regards to all the different grade level responsibilities they have, to try and do this as well, we feel like our counselors are spread really thin. And so in order to help them do their job better and to help us service our students better, uh, especially the ones who are out and need that person who can have a clear focus on uh, those kids. And if they can help out in other ways uh, in the counseling department, that'd be fine. Uh, but right now to, to have that person who could uh, just be that point person for the students, for the families, for the teachers, um, for all the outside constituencies that are working for that uh, family would be uh, really well worth uh, having um, at our buildings. So Steve, I don't know if you wanna add anything there. No, I just think uh, the only other um, added piece of that is that you know this year the transitions are unique. Um, we are about to welcome in at Johnson alone, 11 students from the remote learning program back into the hybrid model. Um, and getting those students squared away and scheduled and helping them transition socially into a school setting where some of them haven't even been to, the, to this middle school yet um, is something that the, that the, the, the transition counselor is going to help us with our transition coach will be helping them with this year. Um, and we don't know yet what the fall is going to look like and what transitions might be required there. So uh, another great support for the students at the middle schools. Thank you. Stephen, any questions for middle school or high school before we go to elementary? I have a quick question for high school. Sure, Carrie. Okay, thanks. Um, so just for Principal Inbush, I remember last year on, on last year's version of this list, there was a, a position of a dropout prevention specialist for the high school. Um, and I'm just wondering about that position in particular and why we're not seeing it on the list for this year. So, um, yeah, I did take that off for this year. Um, it is a, it, we're not doing any of the, um, of the uh, uh, coaching right now for, for kids in that program, even, even as small as we were doing it with three or four kids, we're not doing any this year. Um, and we're not sure whether it's going to be possible to do it next year. Uh, what, what we do know is that we will want to build on what we had done so far. And I don't think we will need a, a full-time position to make, to, to start the program. Um, if we're back into a regular schedule, I would like to get it started, but I think we can do that in-house until such time as we can build the program. So um, with everything else um, that we need, I figured I would take that off for this year. 
but it is something that I think we will see again on the list most likely next year. Okay, that makes sense. And it, it seemed like something that was um, really important for us to have going forward. And, you know, I understand the circumstances this year might not make it necessary, but I'm glad to know that it's still, you know, still on the table for future discussion. So thank you. Yep. Thanks, Nancy. Um, a question and a comment. For the middle school principals, the transition coach that you have right now is filled by a grant, you said. What's the likelihood of that grant coming through for next year? I might have to step in and answer that just because I had a conversation oh. with Kathy Garvin today about the grant. Um, the grant is scheduled uh, for the next two years and it's actually a 10 year grant. Um, you just have to reply at the, excuse me, reapply at the end of every two years. Um, and make sure you meet the requirements of the grant, which we've done so. So she was pretty confident that would continue to come in um, for the next eight years as a 10 year grant. But it's a great question. So for full transparency, that's the that's the short answer. It's also important to recognize that the grant money that's set aside for that purpose is only about $20,000. It's not anywhere near the amount of money that we would need to fund the entire position. It's actually a little bit more than that, Steve, because there's movement in the grant that will take place next year. So that's uh, it's, this year it's 20, but it will be more than that for the future. So that's, uh, that, that will be it. Well, that's encouraging. That's good. Um, my, other, my other comment is about the um, PE teacher or the health wellness teacher at the high school. Um, I, I, I would like to be supportive of the health piece of it, I'm, I'm open to the idea that many districts do not require their athletes. And maybe it's just the varsity athletes, maybe it's athletes at, at all levels to take gym. They, they're, they still meet the requirement that we're trying to get at by waiving it for some or or possibly all of their athletes. I'd like to look into that a little bit more because, um, because money's tight. So I just wanted to, to put that out there that uh, um, it, it's something that I would like to have more information on before we funded it. Okay, thank Thanks. you. Any other questions for the middle school or high school? Uh, Nance, uh, Madam Chair, through you, yes. uh, to kind of, um, Carrie touched on this a little bit, but for your two levels, I, I, I know we, 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 we've spoke about this budget being a needs based, and, and I always like to ask, what's the next level? I, I, I know that this is an aspirational list, it's a needs based list, but like what, what is the next kind of thing um, on your horizon as a emergent need i know kind of steve unpacked a little bit but maybe the middle school can like speak a little more to what what kind of the next things in in the line of priority would be for your um for you guys um unless you're good no i i would say i mean in, instead of one you'd have two you know, and they'd be slash transition coach counselor position. Yeah. One of each school. We'd have more counseling staff at both middle schools. That's that's pie in the sky, big ticket items. But um, you know, the, the the transition coach plays some of those roles. But it would be great to have additional counseling staff. Uh, I think that the addition of the team chair, a second team chair, would be a huge help for the middle school. I I agree with. I just want to jump on that bandwagon. So yes, I agree with that. Thank you. See, Nancy. Related to that, um, how, how about what is needed to fill the gaps for the kids who didn't do well during hybrid learning and may have, have some additional gaps and or any kind of professional development that you might be interested in doing 
for a variety of reasons, but I remember at the beginning of this year, there was um, real concern over the fact that we didn't do leveled math classes. And I think we were gonna do English classes too. So kind of the differentiated instruction um, piece, do we need more professional development um, or anything along the professional development lines I'd be interested in knowing about? I think, you know, in, in talking about the team chair and expanding on that just for a minute, I, I think what we've started to envision is somebody who day to day can work with teachers or provide even small groups uh, professional development. The, the chair right now has been doing PD on PD days, but they've been largely around uh, special ed process and procedure and, and regulation and IP writing. Um, this would give them some time and ability uh, to bring their content knowledge into the classroom and, and work with teachers uh, on a more intimate basis because they're not bopping between two schools and they don't have as many kids that, that they're doing going to meetings on and things like that. So, uh, you know, from that standpoint, from that, that position standpoint, I, I think PD would be more of a almost day to day um, occurrence. If I could add to that also in line with the request of the district position, the uh, the ESOL teachers um, are working more and more with classroom teachers. I mentioned that for the classroom teachers had to receive an SEI endorsement to uh, continue their work um, with their L students. But we have found that the effective ESOL teachers are also providing, similar to what Dr. Creel was just mentioning, more PD in the classroom for teachers to successfully meet the needs of L students. So I think both of these positions, both the team chair and the ESOL um, allows, you know, not only for more student support, which is crucial, but also uh, uh, with a lens of professional development. And given that we've increased our coaching capacity in our district, I think we have a lot of fantastic staff that are providing student support and providing the professional development necessary. So um, that's a real need as well. To your question, Nancy, I think a lot of our staff are, are very adept at differentiating the instruction. I think that the challenges that they're facing this year are unique in um, that their that their biggest struggle is reaching kids who who just have a really difficult time learning online. Um, so to that point, you know, we've been both middle schools have been working hard to get more students in four days a week, where the, where the teachers can work with them directly. Um, I, you know, in in terms of looking at PD down the road. I know that we are engaging in a critical examination of both our math and our ELA programs at the middle school level. And so um, there's kind of an emergent um, professional development need or there will be as we get further into that, that process. Thank you. Anybody else will move on to Speaking of counselors, that'll be a good segue to the elementary schools. So who's uh, taking that one? Hi, everybody. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, the elementary principals and I are advocating for our students, families, and staff by requesting a full-time adjustment counselor at each of the elementary schools. Uh, by having the full-time adjustment counselor, we feel that that will be the, the most effective model for supporting and monitoring our students' social emotional progress and overall well being. Um, a well established and trusting uh, counselor to student relationship is critical to an individual's success. And also crucial um, are the relationships that, that adjustment counselor has with um, families, teachers, and staff. And these relationships we feel and we believe can only be created through consistency. Uh, routine meetings, conversations, and in many cases, daily check-ins with individuals are required to teach social emotional skills and to talk about progress being made. The consistency of an adjustment counselor is what many of our students need in order to have a successful day at school. And lastly, when uh, students are in crisis, they need immediate support from the adjustment counselor and, um, you know, of course, these are not predictable and um, the student cannot wait until the adjustment counselor is available. Um, 
So it's for these reasons that we respectfully request a full-time adjustment counselor at each of the elementary schools. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Are there questions about that, that particular position? We've heard it before. I think you guys have made a very compelling case, but um, does anybody want to talk about it or comment on it? I'm just checking the chat also. Uh, thank you, Nancy. No, I think the, the case is really strong. Um, so it's just important to be underscored. You've come now a couple of years with us, so. With the idea of helping kids get off on the right foot and feeling good about school. Yeah, I think that makes it a compelling case. I also don't want to leave uh, our wonderful preschool director, Julie Martin, out. I know that um, there, there's nothing on here for preschool. Um, I, I know that she said she's all set, but I didn't know, Julie, if you wanted to add anything. Um, we're status quo at the preschool, but um, in my former role, I, I, I'd be supportive of the elementary principals and the need. Um, just to advocate for, for that, that there's absolutely that need and the families that need the support. And um, you know, it starts young and what a lot of these kids carry with them at a very, very young age, um, that it's really important to address those needs first in order for them to be accessible as, as students. So um, it's, uh, yes, I would just echo what Brian um, had said. So thank you everyone. Thanks, Julie. Mike, did you want to talk about the, the full day K reduction? We had that in the, the budget last year, um, just to talk about what, what that looks like and, and what it means. So I'd like to talk about the two items. There's the 15,000 kindergarten free and reduced um, item on there. Um, it's been on here for a few years, um, and it was a way for me to work with families, a funding source to work with families to either reduce or eliminate extreme examples, um, the fee associated with kindergarten uh, to allow most students to uh, attend full day kindergarten rather than half day. I think we have reached approximately that point um, without having to use a $15,000. Um, I've been able to work with 12 families this year um, to reduce the fees and absorb it within the current ex uh, kindergarten fee overall. A slight rise in enrollments does offset uh, extra burden of these fees. It also doesn't cost us extra for teachers uh, to waive a fee. Uh, we're already covering those costs as is. So I think the really good story is we have very, I think a handful of students that are still in half day K. And I think some of those are by choice. Um, and I do not know of anyone who cannot attend full day K if they requested assistance. So. I think the 15,000 is not necessary at this point. I would not advocate for it. Moving down to the full day K uh, further reduction. So $100,000 would be approximately, and again, I say approximately, you can look on the comprehensive and see it's 450,000 total revenue we bring in. But again, that fluctuates every year. So if we say that 100,000 is a quarter of the fee that we collect, then we can decrease the fee by a quarter, uh, which would drop it from 1800 where it currently sits to approximately 1350. Um, obviously making it more affordable for families uh, to send their, their children to full day K. Again, we have pretty much everyone who wants to attend, again, is attending full day K. This is a, obviously a pandemic. It's probably one of the most stressful financial times we're going to encounter. And we still have the vast majority of all students attending full day K. So again, a, a really optimistic story there. Um, I would leave it to the school committee to, to decide where that priority ranks with them. But I think we're getting a job done pretty well with the existing uh, fee structure and the uh, existing fee assistance for families. I see Bill's hand. Uh, three, Madam Chair, just kind of so a point of information maybe to, to Mike and to um, Bill. 
with, with the 50, I, I just, I'm horrible at math, but um, with the $15,000 in there um, now and that, um, that middle school position that was, what was it, uh, 55, but may not, we may be getting some of that back. What is, um, can, can we say tonight, even looking off the draft, that the total position number is more like a, a 520 or 530,000 um, cost and not a 545? I know we're being you know, very cautious and it's like the first night, but. I mean, I would be comfortable advocating for that. I don't see the 15 is necessary if you wanted to drop it. You're saying, Bill, from 545? Yeah, if it's, yeah, or, or you know, if, if we get some indicators that we can better um, represent the partial grant for the transition coach as well, if it's not really 55, if it's more like 30. Um, and also, I think we discussed, I remember when we had this discussion last year around full day K, we were all kind of feverishly, um, doing the back of the envelope addition, it, it, um, there's an opportunity to do a full hundred advocate for the full hundred thousand. But if things move around, there's still an opportunity to get a portion of that, I think, um, going forward. So I, I know that's kind of a fluid number as well. We, 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 in the past made a kind of commitment as a body to try to achieve free full day kindergarten, um, even on a lengthening schedule given all the, the roadblocks and things like the global pandemic but i think that's that's a number that i would kind of consider on a sliding scale as well yes i'm going to stop sharing so i can see Pete. we can see Pete. okay do other people have questions for anybody in the elementary level or for the preschool level? I would ask the, the principals at that level the same question I asked before. When you think about the kids that are not doing well in this COVID environment, um, have you thought about what we can do to help them and are there any additional resources specific to that that you need? Or, um, it, um, and I guess I'm getting at not necessarily personnel, although it might be, um, if there is any kind of um, professional development or consulting, or I'm not even sure, but um, I, I'm interested in both personnel and non-personnel solutions. Nancy, I, I, did, I wasn't prepared too much to speak to the PD or consulting, um, you know, because we spoke about that last week, but, you know, there, I can rehash some of the areas of my, um, of my operations budget, you know, that would be dedicated towards some of the PD. Uh, would you like me to do that again? Yeah, I guess I would say, tell us what you have built into the budget and tell us the next three things that you wish you had had the money to do. Well, um, so speaking to, la to last week, um, you know, there, there are really three central areas, well, four central areas of professional development. One is our continued work with KW Diversity. Um, our second is our third and final year with Claire Land again for our Lucy Calkins curriculum. Um, third is uh, we had an audit done last year for our middle school ELA and we'd like to pursue, which we didn't this year because of the pandemic professional development to meet the recommendations of that audit. And then finally, um, I spoke very briefly about uh, math professional development in ninth grade to um, meet the needs as dictated by the iReady data um, that we'll get for our ninth grade students this year. Um, you know, in terms of if, if we had more money in that area and more consultation area, I probably would continue to expand uh, the math professional development. Um, and then another a need is I talked about it briefly, but we We've really grown and I'm very proud of this, our coaches and our coaches provide a tremendous amount of professional development. And I think they've really shown, especially our digital learning coaches, um, 
their tremendous value to our district, but our coaches also need PD. So I think continued professional development to be the best coach you can be. And we have coaches in literacy, we have coaches in digital learning, and we have coaches in mathematics. Um, and I think you're seeing elements of coaching in special education. So I, um, that's an area that I didn't include in my um, operation budget, but that I, I think about constantly to ensure that we're providing our coaches with support. So I hope that answered your, your question. Um, and I hope I summarized everything you were looking for there. No, that's good. I think that that sometimes if, um, well, it's two parts. We have, we have to first figure out how much money we, we really are gonna be able to get from the town. But one of the things that makes our budget unique this year is the fact that we, we do have some positions in this year's budget funded with one-time money. And it was the right thing to do at the time. We did it completely transparently and it avoided putting people on the unemployment lines, which was our, our key reason for doing it. Ideally, we will secure that money so that we have it for the positions that we need. But if we were to have one-time money, professional development is a good area to use it because it is not recurring in the same way that staff is. So that's why I was asking specifically about that. But thank you, that's a good list. Other questions for, yeah, Carrie. I'd just like to go back to the um, question about the middle school team chair position, if I could, for a second. So um, did I hear correctly that the current team chair who covers both Bird and Johnson has a caseload of about 115? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And given the fact that certain programs are housed in, you know, one or the other of the buildings, would that 115 be roughly split down the middle or would it be weighted at one school versus the other? Um, roughly split, split. You know, I think there are some details that we'd want to work out uh, and there are some dominoes um, that, that might impact some other staff members and, and what their role would be. Uh, but I, I would imagine a, a fairly rough split, you know, if not 50-50, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay, and um, our team chairs, are they in our teachers union or are they WTA members? Yes. They are, okay. Um, so last question on this, knowing that our counseling staff at our middle schools is minimal at the moment and that they are the people responsible for being 504 coordinators, if we were to get this additional position, would we consider shifting the responsibility of 504 coordinator over to our team chairs to free up our counselors to do more social, emotional, and academic support? I would prefer not. I would prefer that that the, the special ed team chair and the 504 team chair not be the same person so that you could refer a student who might be ineligible for SPED to 504 and not have parents dealing with the same team chair. I think to keep those processes separate would, would be a good idea. But I think, you know, with a team chairs anchoring in one building, I think there is potential to free up counseling staff um, through other duties. And I think some of those are some of the discussions we'll have with the principals and the current team chair to see how that that might might work. Okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions or comments? One thing that we talked about last year is if um, if someone were to take a look at, at our list of potential new positions, I think they might say you're we're focusing on um, kids who have difficulty in school more so than the typical kid or the kid who thrives in school. And I think what, what people need to understand is if a classroom teacher is properly supported with, by the people who can help the, the student who struggles, that allows that the regular classroom teacher to concentrate on what she or he does best. So um, we are not by any means heavy in these, in these areas. And um, we were really hopeful last year 
that we were going to be able to to fund some of these positions. Um, and you know, I think that it's it's an exciting time in Walpole in that we have a new superintendent and new assistant superintendent and some really energetic principals that really want to do the best for us. So um, I think we've got a lot to consider here because I would not call this anything more than a, um, a needs-based budget. It's bigger than a level service budget, but it, it meets the needs in a way that I think could really give our district some, um, some exciting chances to, um, to help more kids and to grow. So I guess that when I look at that list, that's what I see. And Nancy, I think it's important to note that, you know, it's great to get this feedback from the school committee, because when we go back to the LC group um, as early as tomorrow morning, um, you know, it's fresh in our mind, these discussions and, and taking a look at the positions and prioritizing and making sure that we can continue to vet um, our options and knowing that, you know, when you look at the bottom line, um, you know, if we're not able to get all of these positions, you know, which ones and, and what is the order we would put them in and uh, just helps to have your, the feedback from the school committee. So thank you. Yeah, in my mind, that's the next step is to, you know, not necessarily just say whatever the priority was last year has to be the same, but it may, and that's okay too. Um, but we, we, we may not be able to meet all of these needs. Um, I do think that they're, they're reasonable, but, you know, we, uh, prioritizing would help a lot. Are there other questions or comments? Kristen. I just want to say, I, I hear what you're saying, Nancy, and I understand. I think, you know, as like the SPED mom on the school committee, I'm, I'm appreciative of that. But I also think that some of the um, transition coach, the counselors at the elementary school, some of that can help like all the learners. Some of the social emotional doesn't just impact the, the lower performers or struggling students. I think there are also a lot of high performing students who are under a lot of pressure who need that social emotional support. So I'm in favor of that. I think there's sort of that, there's always been this pressure, especially at, at sort of middle school and high school level. And I think it's getting, it has gotten worse. This year is kind of crazy. So um, providing that social emotional support as kids come back maybe to that regular schedule and are now trying to catch up and, and realize what does a, what does a full week look like? What did I miss? You know, those high performers may feel more pressure that they lost time. Um, so I think I like the balance of this, that there, there is some support to sort of even up for um, the special ed support, but also that social emotional that I think is gonna be even, we're gonna feel it a lot more next year. So I, I, I think this is a good list. Well said, Kristen. I would also just like to, to chime in on the kindergarten tuition. I think that it's a, a goal that we've had for a while. I think that, um, that many good districts have moved towards reducing their, their tuition to zero. And um, I think that, that progress is important in that regard too. Anybody else? Sean. I just want to take a moment to echo what my other colleagues have said, and I appreciate the responsible request that you've put forth. Um, you know, none of these are extravagant, and they're all really to help all of our students um, have the best uh, learning experiences within our district as possible. Um, you know, that includes the kindergarten tuition. Um, as other districts go through their budgeting process, none of them are adding uh, tuition back onto their kindergarten students. Um, you know, that's almost a given just across the entirety of Massachusetts. 
um, because it's an educational necessity uh, for our students to, you know, be able to continue to progress. Um, so just throwing that out there as well. Um, but thank you again. Anything else? This is a long process, and I think people have watched this and seen this. So um, we will take a vote next Thursday night, and that vote will reflect the, um, the budget that we would like to bring forward. We often have to compromise from that, from that initial request. But um, I think this is a great way to um, to be ready to discuss and to to defend these requests. Um, and I do think that if you could help us by prioritizing, that would be even more helpful. But it's a re very reasonable request if you ask me. Are there any people in the chat? that would like to comment because we're getting close to the end of this and I probably should have made that clearer earlier on, but can somebody check the chat for me? Nancy, I've been monitoring it. There's, a, there's no comments in the chat. Okay, thank you. Unless there's anything else, um, I would take a motion to close the public hearing and then a motion to adjourn, but is there anything else that um, Bridget or my Krisha or Bill that anybody would like to add at this point? No, just don't forget about the community forum tomorrow night. There you Real go. Building project tomorrow night. Okay, if that's the case, I'll take a motion first to close the public hearing, please. I make uh, three, Madam Chair, I make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion by Bill, a second by Kristen. Um, and I will pull the committee. Bill? Yes. Jen? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Kristen? Yes. Sean? Yes. And Nancy? Yes. And now we just need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, was that Carrie? Yes. Made the motion, and then Jen will give you the second. Okay, polling the committee. Bill? Yes. Jen? Yes. Carrie? Yes. Kristen? Yes, right, Kristen? Okay. Sean? Yes. And Nancy? Yes. And Bridget, it's 812. Got it. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for all the work, administrators and principals and all of you. We appreciate it. That was well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Elsie. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night.